LegalizeFreedom.com Why are we here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? From the nature of reality to the future of humanity. Beyond politics, poverty and war. LegalizeFreedom.com Greetings and welcome once again to LegalizeFreedom.com. My name's Greg Moffat and today we are talking with Anthony Peake about his brand new book, The Labyrinth of Time. In The Labyrinth of Time, Anthony explores the relationship between consciousness and reality and in the process puts forward an amazing hypothesis that can explain many enigmatic phenomena, including deja vu, precognition, near-death experience and altered states. Central to his hypothesis is a new understanding of the nature of time and a radical updating of the theories of two of the 20th century's most original thinkers, Peter Ospensky and J.W. Dunn. Uh, Anthony then looks at the concepts of time and how they have shaped our thinking as individuals through the prism of science, philosophy and literature. Uh, the book features a cutting-edge account of modern time theory, covering time slips, precognitive dreams and the elasticity of time during moments of extreme stress, near-death experiences and certain stages of hypnotic trance. The Labyrinth of Time is as compelling and persuasive as Anthony's previous books, Is There Life After Death?, and the daemon. Hello and welcome Anthony Peake and thank you very much for taking time uh, to join us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Hello and thank you for inviting me along. I'm really looking forward to our chat. Now today Anthony we're going to uh, be discussing your new book uh, The Labyrinth of Time and perhaps you could just set out uh, just briefly for the listeners um, what it's about. Uh, okay, the time has long fascinated me, and the Labyrinth of Time is my fourth book, um, or technically my third or fourth, because I had two books coming out at virtually the same time in, in November of last year. But in my writing, I've been long intrigued by how human consciousness processes time, uh, and how time is depicted in philosophy, within science, and even within uh, culture um, across the ages. And this, is, this book is my attempt to do a, a really all-singing, all-dancing review of exactly what time is and how we perceive time to be. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed writing it because it gave me the opportunity to go into some of my famous favourite movies, some of my favourite poems, some of my favourite even musical pieces, to just convey the idea of exactly what time is and why it is so mysterious and so odd. I mean, I'm very much taken by the original famous quotation by St. Augustine when he was asked about time and he reflected on it for a second and he said time is the kind of thing that if you don't think about it you know you understand it but as soon as you start to reflect on exactly what it really is it becomes a total mystery and I think that's what I'm trying to convey in this book is just how time is all around us it's something we exist within and yet it is something that is a complete and utter logical, uh, ontological, epistemological mystery. Um, and and it, it's, it's just purely fascinating. Yeah, well, it's probably something that uh, a lot of people don't think about from day to day. They take it as a, a given, like many of the other aspects of, of the reality that we perceive um, and perceive to be real. Um, but the fact that there is an issue there I think is probably for for most people's day to day experience could be highlighted by the difference between experience time uh, versus clock time, and most people will have had that sort of dissonance in their life. Uh, you know, when you're having a good time, time seems to go quickly. When you're in the waiting room at the dentist, it seems to move very slowly. So that tells us straight away that there there is something here. Yes, this is an intriguing concept because um, philosophers for literally centuries have been fascinated by this differentiation between psychological time, i.e. the time that I feel inside my head, to external time. Now, um, a very famous French uh, philosopher by the name of um, 
uh, Henri Bergson very much came uh, defined these two things as being long and durée. And in fact, interestingly enough, Henri Bergson heavily influenced um, a nephew of his um, who um, wrote a very, very famous novel about um, remembrance of times past, um, Marcel Proust. And again, this is to do with memory and time as well. So these things are linked in very much. But for me, the, the whole mystery is, um, if I have an internal clock and an internal clock time, how does that relate to external time? And indeed, is my time the same as the time you're perceiving? Because effectively, externally, we still measure time by the same external uh, measuring devices, which will be a clock face or a digital clock or something like that. But effectively, if we use a normal clock face, what in fact the clock face is measuring if we think about it for a second, is not time at all, but distance. Because what it's doing, it's measuring, say, for half a minute, what it's doing is it's measuring the time in raised commas it takes for the second hand to, to go halfway round a circle. But this, of course, is distance, which is a subtly different thing. Now, also the other intriguing thing about time is that it's the only thing I know that's measured by itself. You know, you can have a pound of apples, but you can only ever have a minute of a minute or an hour of an hour. You know, it's completely self-referential. And this is, again, where the mystery lies. You know, if I have an internal time scale, is it different to external time? And how can I ever know? Well, quite. And um, such as have been, man has been wrestling with this, uh, that in your new book, The Labyrinth of Time, uh, in the early stages, you point out that uh, this is an ancient debate and the philosophy of time, um, you know, the discussions of it, they're trying to get to grips with what it is and what it means. Um, it goes back almost to the, the dawn of man. It does. You know, it's something that time, as we were saying earlier, time is something that we exist within. And the question is, you know, you go back to people like Marcus Aurelius and the original analogy of time being a river. But even if time is a river, what's doing the flowing? And indeed, again in the book, I think I mentioned the idea that we have this idea of time as a river. But in order to know that time is flowing, you need a river bank. In other words, if you're looking at a river and there are no river banks, you have no idea that the river is flowing or indeed in what direction it's flowing because there is no referential point. So the idea is there must be a time by which we measure the movement of time. And interestingly enough, um, this was one of the major issues that uh, stimulated an aeronautical engineer called J.W. Dunn to write a book called An Experiment with Time. And in this book, Dunn, Dunn suggested that, in fact, there is another time which he called time two. And we gauge the flow of time one against time two. So time two is effectively the riverbank. But of course, there then has to be something that gauges time two by, and then you get time three, and you end up with an infinite regress. And as usual, with all things to do with time, your brain starts to hurt. You know, it's um... well. Uh, one uh, th idea that has been put forward uh, more than once uh, is trying to uh, get away from the the abstraction of it, uh, almost to say, you know, why do we need to uh, try and define this? And rather just say that time is merely um, a lens uh, through which we view existence uh, and events and of itself uh, isn't really important. Very true. There, um, there's a fascinating book, book um, written by a, um, a Oxford Don um, by the name of Julian Barber. And Julian is a theoretical physicist and he's written a book called The End of Time. And what Julian suggests is, and this is something that is kind of new but not, is the idea that time, time in itself doesn't exist. Time does not flow. What flows is consciousness and the way we perceive time. So in other words, time consists of a series of slices, as it were, and each slice is in itself static. Now, this is something, again, that um, Hermann Minkowski, who was the uh, teacher of Albert Einstein, decided upon as well. And they call this Minkowskian time. And it's the idea that time is like I use the I use the analogy in the book. Um, it's like imagine that you could take a time lapse 
photograph of somebody's life. So in other words, you know when you take these time-lapse photographs of somebody moving their arm or walking across a room, and instead of seeing the person, you see a kind of a snake-like thing moving across the room. Now imagine somebody's whole life. You took a time-lapse photograph of somebody's whole life. So the critical fusion facility of the camera or the shutter speed of the camera was 70 years rather than rather than 1 20th of a minute or 1 50th of a minute or whatever it is, a second, I should say. A human being would then actually be a, a very long snake-like creature that would, would sort of weave around the surface of the planet like a snake. And indeed, the, um, the Hindu philosophers have a term for this, and I think they call it the Ling Surya, which is the long body. And it's the idea that this is all what we really are. In other words, at any time, at any moment in our life, we are literally just a, a snapshot or a slice, like a slice, a slice and a sliced loaf of bread. This is the reality I am now. And the next bit of reality will be the next slice of the loaf as I move through it. Now, again, if any of your listeners are aware of the plays of J.B. Priestley, one of his plays, Time and the Conways, very much discusses this very idea. And again, it's again vaguely related to J.W. Dunn and to people like Henri Bergson. And the idea that we perceive the moment, but the reality is, inter is external and external to us and eternal. So in other words, time, as somebody else once said, is time is God's way of making sure that everything doesn't happen at once. And in many ways, these things are all very, very intriguing ideas. And again, I strongly suggest if anybody is interested in the whole scientific basis of these ideas, to very much read the Julian Barber book. Because again, if you look into quantum physics, the one thing that's intriguing about quantum physics is that at that level of reality, time, time flow doesn't exist. Time can flow backwards or forwards. Indeed, um, uh, Dirac, the famous um, uh, uh, physicist from the 1930s and the 1940s, proposed that positrons which we now use regularly in positron emission tomography and such like, positrons are in fact made of antimatter. And not only that, but there are electrons traveling backwards in time. Now, this is a mind-blowing concept, isn't it? The idea that, that, that there are times that are going backwards and forwards all around us, and we just can't perceive them. But yet these particles are used to actually look inside the human body. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole mystery of time really um, highlights, you mentioned quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and that's one of the areas that uh, uh, modern reductionist materialistic science um, has been struggling with and kind of trying to put the problems that it, it raises up to one side to be dealt with uh, later or possibly never. And when the same reductionist materialistic science uh, is brought to bear on the issue of time, well, quite often it's simply not because they can't get anywhere with it and... It once again shows us that the uh, the modern scientific idea that uh, the nature of reality in the universe, all the major explanations are in, you know, and we're just waiting to fine tune a few details. Yeah. That this is very, very far from the case. Very far, exactly. Um, I am reminded of a similarity in the present scientific position to the scientific position of 110 years ago, 1901, 1902 when there was such a degree of certitude, um, one famous um, scientist, and I, his name escapes me, um, turned around and said that uh, we genuinely believe that we are so close to knowing everything, it is just a matter of fine tuning to a couple of decimal points. However, they had one or two black swans that didn't seem to make sense, such as uh, black body radiation and the photoelectric effect. And without putting a fire, going into great detail on these, these things did, could not be explained by Newtonian physics and the, the paradigm of the time. And in fact, the only way they got out of this impasse was a, a German scientist called Niels, uh, Niels Bohr, not, uh, not Niels Bohr at all, it was, um, whose name escapes me, gosh, my brain is normally quite good on these things, um, uh, uh, Max Planck mm -hmm. uh, wrote a paper explaining how the photoelectric effect worked and effectively, what he did was he had to explain that energy was not continual and came in tiny packets. And, of course, the Latin for packet is quanta. 
And that is exactly where the whole idea of quantum physics came along. Now, the intriguing thing about Planck when he did this was he used this as a model to explain. He never believed that his model was an actual explanation of reality as it stood. All it was was a conversion of the maths that would make sense to fit the observed phenomenon. Of course, we now know that he was actually right. And in fact, Max Planck spent the rest of his life horrified at the implications of what he had discovered, as was Einstein, who in 1905, when he came along and wrote his first paper on relativity, he, he explained other strange phenomenon that really didn't fit in. Now, we find ourselves now at the beginning of the 21st century with a similar problem. There are certain elements of, of, of modern observed particle physics that simply do not make sense within our, 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 our present model and understanding of reality. We have the, 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 the observed effect that particles can be in two places, places at the same time. We have the observed phenomenon that particles can, can effectively burrow out of this reality into another one and come back into this reality in a different place. We have particles that if you, if you entangle them, that is, you put them in the same state, and then you send those particles off in different directions, even millions of miles away from each other, if you do one thing to one particle, the other particle instantaneously reacts. Now, this concept of superposition, and as Einstein called it, spooky action at a distance, makes no sense within our present model of reality. How can... Uh, one particle know that something has been done to hit its other particle. Now, again, there'll be a lot of listeners out there who'll be saying, oh, he's talking total nonsense. Now, I met up with Professor Jeff Forshaw. Um, Jeff Forshaw, you may be aware of, he's the, he was the PhD tutor of um, the guy that does a lot of TV programs at the moment. A uh, young guy used to be in a rock band, uh, used to be in Doreen. Um, his name again will come to me. And Jeff writes books with this guy. And Jeff and I were having coffee before we were both doing a talk at the National Theatre in London before a performance of Time and the Conways, ironically enough. And Jeff over coffee just dropped into the conversation the line, well, of course, you know that we know that every electron in the universe knows the position of every other electron. Now, this suggests that a deeper level of reality, everything is related to everything else. You know, there is no separation. There is no distance between things. Again, rather like time, space is also an illusion. And I remember a very famous um, thought experiment put forward by Mac, the guy that um, came up with Mac speed. And Mac turned around and said that if there was only one object in the universe, how could you tell it was moving? And this again comes down to the river analogy of time. You know, movement is relative to other things. And indeed, if there was only one object in space, would space exist? And if that one object disappeared, would there be anything at all? Because all space is, is the container that contains everything that there is. But that if there was nothing, would space still be there? So these are incredibly deep philosophical questions that modern particle physics are having to answer. You know, and they are, they are questions that really the present paradigm cannot accommodate. No, and I would suggest actually to anyone listening uh, who <clears throat> is interested in reading uh, A Labyrinth of Time to explore uh, your thoughts and research on the nature of time, they would also, if they haven't already, it would really pay off to, uh, to get introduced to uh, the world of quantum physics because the two tie together so intimately that uh, and all the concepts you've just been discussing have a lot of relevance uh, to your research on the nature of time as well. There are some wonderful introductory books to quantum physics, and I can advise one that came out comparatively recently is wonderful. It's called How to Teach Quantum Physics to Your Dog. And this is a wonderful book because it really does reduce it down to the actual fact, the observable facts, rather than trying to back explain how we came to these conclusions. Um, there is another book um, written by a guy called uh, Professor Rosenberg, who's professor of physics at uh, UCLA. And they've written a book, I think it's called Consciousness Encounters Physics or something like that. Again, it's, Rosen it's written by a guy called, guys called Rosenberg and Kuttner. 
Uh, so just check it up on Amazon as to the actual uh, name of the book. Normally when um, I'm in circumstances doing interviews, I have my bookcases around me, but I'm actually not located in my normal location today. Um, I'm rather like a subatomic particle that's actually moved somewhere else. <laughs> so I don't, I don't actually have... I'm not entangled with my bookcase, so therefore I cannot actually sort of pick the book out and give you some further details. Oh, not, not to worry. Um, with regards to uh, the sort of modern scientific establishment that we referred to earlier and their take on all these things, um, it, it really does remind us that, uh, that as human beings, we have a tremendous need for certainty to know what is and to basically have the jury in and have the answers, even if they're not quite complete, to just feel that we know what's going on. And it's actually a flaw in our nature. And I think that there's a growing number of people, thankfully, who are open to the idea that we may never know what is going on, that the nature of reality may forever elude us. What Certainly while we're in this form, in this living reality, you know, on Earth, there may be something before all that, after all that, beyond all that. But as experienced uh, here on this planet in our human form, we may have to accept that the fundamental nature of existence is, is beyond us. Well, that is the problem, isn't it? As, as philosophers will say, um, that when you're within a system, you can never understand the system because you're within the system. It's rather like the argument that we will never understand the functioning of the brain because we are our brain, or there's those arguments to say, but we are at least an epiphenomenon of our brain that um, there is fairly strong evidence to say that consciousness um, is, is, a, is created by the brain, is, is attuned by the brain or whatever, but obviously there is a link here and it's understanding. Now, it's that the same goes for an awful lot of these concepts, because it could just be that we do not have the, the cognitive abilities to think outside of these mysteries. For instance, one of the major problems in particle physics is something called the wave particle duality. And this is the, this is, this is the observed fact that if you take a, 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 um, a, a light wave and you don't observe it, the light wave acts as a wave, i.e. it's, it's um, a, a vibration in another medium, for want of a better term, and it's, and it's pushed out in space. I mean, a light wave or any kind of wave is out in space, and it, it, it exists smeared in time. But if you actually observe it or you attempt to measure it, it immediately becomes a point particle. So in other words, a light wave, which is a wave, the moment you measure it or observe it, it becomes a photon. And a photon is a point position in space and time. If you look away again, the point position in space and time changes back into being a wave. And this happens every single time they try to do this. Now, again, I've discussed this in lectures and talks and everything else. And people, the general members of the public, simply do not believe me. And yet, this if you read copies of The New Scientist, this is regularly one of the subjects they discuss all the time. And the question here then is, is does the act of observation change a potential wave? Because, of course, in particle physics, the waves in particle physics are called wave functions. And these are statistical wave functions of probability. So, in other words, there is in a room... There there is a probability you will discover an electron in one position or another. Depending upon the probability of it being found where you think it is will be almost 100%. But there's also a very small possibility that the, the electron might be the other side of the room. Now, this is how particle physics works. It works on probability waves. So what we do when we observe something is we collapse, we collapse the probability of something taking place or not taking place. Now, this suddenly becomes very intriguing because this means, in effect, that my act of observation affects the external world that I perceive. And therefore, I could change the probability of an outcome depending upon my decision. Now, again, uh, recently, Stephen Hawking and an associate of her, his called Hertog wrote a paper about this. Now, remember, this is Stephen Hawking. This is not some new age guru. This is Stephen Hawking. And he, he has this new model whereby he argues 
that every single outcome of every event exists out, out there in a probability wave. Depending upon our decisions is which probable, probable future comes into existence. We collapse the wave function of that probable future. However, each of the other probable futures that could have been outcomes of the other decisions we made still exist in potentiality. Because time, again, is something that is an illusion brought about by ourselves. So it is rather like we are living in a super duper DVD hard drive containing the data for every single potentiality for every single event. And all we do is, as we, when we play a first person computer game, is we observe and our avatar on the computer screen, if we're playing an RPG game, goes down one corridor or another. And the corridor it goes down is the corridor that comes into existence. But the other corridor is still there. Well, this is very much like the idea that people discuss in life. They talk about being at a fork in the road you know, of life. And I, yeah. cho I chose to do this. Uh, so therefore, all the events that might have flowed from me choosing to do that uh, are now forever cut off, even though the, the, the two paths may cross again at some point in the future. Uh, and this idea of lots of parallel streams of possibility is something that you uh, get into in the book. And something that ties in with that is the ultimate nature of time, which you basically say, well, let's think about this. It can be only one of two things. Either time is linear or it's cyclical. I, if time started at some point, then presumably it will end at some point. And if it didn't start, then it must be going round and round. Uh, a thought that occurred to me is, well, if it's cyclical, when did it start? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, the, the, there is if you look into the, the old pictures of the, um, the, the old philosophers and the, the alchemists, they had something called the Ouroboros, which is the, the snake eating its own tail. And the circularity goes on and on and on. This idea of what's called the eternal recurrence or the eternal return. This has been a perennially popular philosophical concept. For centuries, and indeed, as you rightly say, you know, we only have two alternatives here. You know, we, we can argue that the Big Bang started it all, but the Big Bang is supposed to then end in the Big Crunch, and the Big Crunch then becomes another Big Bang. So we still get back to the circularity. And of course, the only way you can ever th think about eternity in time is by a circularity, because if it's linear, you know, it has to have started. Anything that linear has to have a point start and it has to have a point ending because as, as um, there are three arrows of time that scientists, you know, discuss. There's thermodynamic. This is the direction from order to disorder, which is which is very much the way Newtonian physics works. Then you have psychological, which is direction from perceptions to memories. In other words, I have a perception or an anticipation of something that's about to happen like I had anticipated this interview taking place. It is now in actuality, and I'm perceiving this interview. And then in an hour's time, this, this interview will then become a memory. So there you have a, a, a linear stream there. But of course, then we have causal as well, you know, that cause and effect. You know, I, I, I push something and it falls over, or I smash a glass. And of course, if I... I smash a glass on the floor and get back then to the thermodynamic because what's happened is I've taken a glass which is in a high a high feeling of order which means it's in a I think it is I never get this right a, a low state of um, equilibrium if I smash it it then becomes disordered and the problem is and the reason we think that time flows in a particular direction is that the, the thermodynamic model is not reversible in other words you can have a hot cup of tea and as the as the energy dissipates from that hot cup of tea, it goes colder. You will never get a hot, a hot cup of tea becoming hotter unless you add more energy to it. And this is why we see the world the way we do. But for me, there's something more to this. The idea that that somehow all, as you said, all the futures that can possibly be are out there. Now, one of my favorite writers is, is Jorge Borges who was the Argentinian writer, who came up with a very famous quotation that I've always loved, by the way, as an aside, 
during the the Falklands War, uh, he he likened the the uh, Falkland Islands to being being um, two an our battle two men two bald men fighting over a comb. And I always thought that was a, a wonderful <laughs> analogy. Wonderful guy. And uh, Borges wrote an amazing short story called The Garden of the Four King Paths. And in this, he conveys this idea of multiple times that run parallel and weave within each other. Now, this is very interesting for me because literally this morning I received a message from one of my Facebook associates who've read some of my work. I have thousands of people that contact me on Facebook and they give me their experiences. And this guy, literally, his wife had a dream that he that he was going to die the next day. And she had the dream of, um, of, I think I'm right in saying that she had a dream that the police had come to the front door and said he'd been killed in a car crash. Quite coincidentally, he is sitting in his car the next day and he should have gone to the back of his car, I think, to pick something out from the back of the boot. And something stopped him doing this. And he didn't. And as he did so, I think somebody hit the back of his car. He'd have been killed. Something stopped him doing it. But what is even weirder is that his wife had a dream where she dreamt the alternate future that was in anticipation of an event that he managed to avoid happening. Now, that's mind blowing. And and I know that people have these experiences all the time. Well, I mean. I mentioned to you just before uh, we started the interview, actually, that I had a, a you know a miniature version of precognition this very morning, which uh-huh. it may be completely insignificant, but it fascinates me because I'm interested in these things. And over the years, um, I've never had to get up and go out to uh, a job. I've always worked for myself. So therefore, I've woken up naturally in the morning and not by an alarm clock. And I've always thought this would be the best way for, for humans to do it, actually, just to wake when you wake and start your day. But of course, because time and clocks rule everything, you have to be at the office at nine, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a fundamental aversion to being woken by an alarm. I've never found one that was gentle enough to uh, not be irritating, but be loud enough to wake me up. (laughs) So I've got a fundamental aversion to this. And what I found was that in the few times I did have to set an alarm to get up, I was starting to wake up before the alarm went off. Now, I told myself, it's just my brain training me because I hate the bloody thing so much. I'm going to wake up beforehand and then I can get up, turn off the alarm before it even triggers. But as the years have gone by, this has got closer and closer to the time that the alarm's gone off to the point where I'm thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. It's, you know, it's within five minutes. This morning, I was waking up with an alarm, don't like to do it. And in, I was dreaming. I was aware that I was dreaming in the way that we somehow are. A voice in my head said, no. I, le- I leant over in the bed, turned on my left hand side, reached for the alarm clock, as I always do, and pressed it And as it was going off. And this voice in my head just said, it was as clear wow. as day. It said, no. Wow. <laughs> wow. And now there's something going on there. People might say, oh, some little anecdote about his alarm clock, but something's happening that uh, allows it to be fine tuned so much. There, there are two things that come to mind there. The first one is there was a series of experiments done in the early mid 1990s by Dick Bierman and Dean Radin, uh, two researchers, member of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. And what they did was, it's quite intriguing, what they did was they placed people in front of a TV screen. And on the TV screen was, was flickered a series of images of fluffy pussy cats and, and beautiful scenery and sunsets. But within these pictures were also placed scenes of horror, like a car crash or something awful. And what they did was they actually rigged up the, uh, a machine to measure the, um, the conductancy of the skin. Because it's known that when people are stressed, the, the skin conductancy changes. Something happens in the electrical impulses in the skin. So what they were able to do is then gauge whether somebody is stressed or not. Now, what is fascinating about these experiments is that they discovered that in most cases, people would react to the horrific picture coming up about two or three seconds before the picture was shown on the screen. 
which means they were anticipating or something was monitoring the immediate future of their own consciousness. Now, there is a counter argument to this, which says that there's something called the gambler's fallacy. And this is the idea that if you, for instance, if you're gambling and the numbers keep coming up red on, on a, when you're playing roulette, the more times that it comes up red, the more you anticipate the fact that black will come up. But of course, statistically, every time the ball goes round, there's still a one in two chance that it will be red or black. But the gambler's fallacy is that you believe that the more times one thing has come up makes it more likely to come up the next time. And this is exactly what I think it's Richard Wiseman, Professor Wiseman says is happening with the Radin experiment. Because what he's saying is that the more times that a, not a, a, a pleasant picture turns up, the more the body anticipates that the next one will be a nasty one which to a degree I can accept. However, there has been recent research done that shows that this anticipation can be up to six seconds. And in fact, what it suggests is that we don't have any particular uh, ability on free will because we already know what's going to happen or our body knows what's going to happen before it happens. Now, this reminds me then of the precogs in the, the movie Vanilla Sky, uh, not Vanilla Sky, um, Minority Report the Tom Cruise film based upon a Philip K. Dick uh, short story. Now, clearly, if this ability, we can interpret our immediate future, this could possibly explain why it is that we jump before we hear a bang and why it is you were able to anticipate the alarm clock ringing because you were able to monitor the, the future. Now, there is another neurological explanation for this, and this is the idea that the human brain buffers information before it presents it to consciousness. And in the book, you may recall, I discussed something called the Phi experiment mm -hmm. um, with, with Dean Goodman and co, um, whereby um, you, it, it is to do with the critical fusion facility of the eye. Um, and how it works is that well, I can't go into detail now because it's quite complex to do, but, but effectively read it in the book, and this explains how this can happen. But I'm particularly taken by your story, though, because you may recall in the book I discuss about the dream of Alfred Maury, and this has always fascinated me. I've mentioned it in two or three of my books. Now, Alfred Maury was a psychologist uh, in the late 19th century, but when he was a younger man, he, he, was, he was down with fever, and he was lying in bed, and he, in his dream state, in his fever state, he had a dream. And in the dream, he was um, a member of the, the French Revolutionary Council during the 1790s, during the French Revolution. And he was an associate of Robespierre and Marat and, and, and various other members of the, the, the revolution. However, as time progresses in his dream, he falls foul of them. He does something wrong. So there's a huge show trial. And in the show trial, he does his own defense. So he, prote he, he, he presents his own defense, but he knows he's going to fail. Then the jury goes out and they deliberate and they come back and they sentence him to death. He's then taken down to the cells and he's given a, short, a time in the cells on his own. Then they come and they get him and they take him out and they drive him through the streets of Paris in a tumbrel. They then get to the Place de la Bastille or the Place de la Concorde, wherever the guillotines used to be at that time. And he stands in front of the guillotine and he makes this long rambling speech about how France needs to pull itself together. Then his head is placed underneath the guillotine and the guillotine comes down. At that moment, the headboard of his bed fell off and hit him on the back of the neck. This means that his brain had back created a whole dream based upon an incident that hadn't happened yet. Yeah, now I've heard of people uh, telling stories about how something happened to them in a dream, and then they woke up and realized that it was something happening in the quote unquote real world that could somehow be seen as, you know, I, 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 I thought I was drowning and then I woke up and I don't know, there was, you know, I, I was choking, whatever it happens to be, there's, there's a sort of crossover between the dream world and the so-called real world. But what you describe is, is uncanny uh, because it, it, it makes sense of the guillotine uh, incident and the headboard falling. But to have this and then the question I would then say was how long in actual measurable time 
did his brain take to formulate that? How long was his body lying there experiencing that dream? What could it have been a split second before the headboard fell? His dream came up with all that and that in his in his subconscious state it felt like longer. I think it is a split second state. And in fact, there's the famous case of the um, the man who dreamt he was eating a huge marshmallow and he woke up and the pillow had gone. That's the one I was trying to think of. I just couldn't remember. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, this is um, this is a very intriguing area because the idea of, of time dilation during times of stress I deal with in my first book is the life after death. Because I suggest that um, what is taking place when we have accidents and everything else and time slows down is that the brain is flooded by a particular neurotransmitter called glutamate. And glutamate is known, one of the effects of glutamate is known to be slowing down how time is perceived to be traveling. Now, there has been a series of experiments recently done by a guy called David Eagleman. Uh, And Eagleman, what he did was he wanted to test this out. And what he did was he actually placed uh, on the wrist of his um, volunteers um, a small TV screen that was flashing images so fast that under normal perception you couldn't see them. And it flashed numbers. And what he did was he placed them on one of those things that you have in um, uh, fairgrounds where you suddenly you go up on something and you suddenly dropped suddenly which gives, puts a great deal of stress on your body. And what he did was he asked the people, as they were falling down, to look at the wristwatch and see if they could see the numbers. Now, what is intriguing in this is that um, the one particular case I saw, and this is on YouTube, by the way, if you just put up Eagleman Time Experiment, um, one of the, the individuals did see the numbers, or very, very close to the numbers. The shapes of the numbers were correct, which implies that perception can slow down under these circumstances. So the glutamate flood does have a perceptible effect on perception in some way. I counter argue that though, and I'd say that if your brain is slowing down, it means that how you perceive external reality slows down as well, but it's an internal thing. And this, I believe, is what happens at the point of death. This is what I believe happens with people when they say, my life flashed before my eyes. Or, you know, people, when they drown, they say, oh, I I flash back through my life. Mm. I suggest that what really happens is that time becomes very, very peculiar during times of stress, during near-death experience, during out-of-the-body experiences. And indeed, this can be proven because glutamate is is chemically very similar in structure to uh, an external substance um, called ketamine. And when people have take ketamine, they say that time slows down. So clearly there is some kind of linking here and it's to do with the transmission of chemicals across the brain. Now, you reminded me, actually, it's, it's not something I forgot, but it's, you just brought it to the forefront of my mind, is that in, in 1993, uh, I was involved in a, in a very big car crash and uh, thankfully walked away from it completely unhurt. But... What basically happened was that my car spun out of control, crossed into the, on a two lane road, spun across into the traffic coming the opposite direction, collided with the car and then kept spinning and spun off into um, a field on the other side of the road. And the traffic police who came out estimated that my car spun nine or 10 times, a complete 360. And I remember while this was happening, and I can remember it clearly because time did slow down. It's the only reason I can tell you that sitting in the car, initial reaction was just, I don't know what it was because it it would just have been blind panic. But I felt Mm. that I was in the car long enough to calm down because as I hit the other car and moved off and went through the fence, I was able to calm down enough to go, oh, it's okay. And I noticed that the music in the car that I'd been playing had switched off. And I had time to, th- to think, oh, the car stereo has gone off. Why has, it, why has it done that? I've crashed into another car. There's no reason for the stereo to turn off. And then the car came to a halt. So if you'd asked me what, what was the experiential time of that, I'd have said, oh, I probably needed about 30 or 40 seconds to think all of that. But mm. in reality, it probably took less than 10 seconds for the accident to happen. This is a phenomenally common occurrence 
Um, whenever I talk to people, uh, whenever I do lectures, there will always be someone in the audience who will have had a similar experience to this. Mm. I can cite an example of one person who told me, and again, this, this has an interesting aside to it as well. He was driving down the M6 uh, on his way on holiday and he was towing a caravan. And as to, and him and his wife were sitting next to each other in the car, and then suddenly he, he felt a slight push. And what had happened was a car, a car or a lorry behind them had gone into the back of the caravan. And as he looked through his windscreen, uh, through the, 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 the mirror, he could see slowly um, the disintegration of his, his caravan into splinters. And then the splinters just go up in the air really slowly and started coming down. And, and he saw the, 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 it part and the, the front of the lorry appear in the back. And he then saw the back of the, his car start to crunch in. And he said he watched as bits of paint fell down incredibly slowly in front of his eyes as, as the car was shaking. He then looked to the left to see his wife and she was being pushed from side to side with the impact. And it was pushing on her safety belt. And the curious thing was that he had sufficient time to think like you did. And he thought, this is ridiculous. We're going to get killed in a car crash on the M6 going on holiday. And he said, I've just spent £13,000 on two hip replacements for my wife. And she's going to get killed in a car crash. Isn't this ridiculous? And that's the thought that went through his mind. He then realized that he needed to do something. So he explained to me he was able to take control of his car and steer it round the cars who were all moving closely. He steered the car between the cars, weaved across and managed to stop the car in, in, the, in the hard shoulder. It was then and only then that the fear hit and the pain hit. But up until then, he was in a completely different world. He was in the world that we go to at the point of death. It was the glutamate. But I now argue it's more than this. I think at that point, something else is happening in the brain. I think that the pineal gland of the brain is releasing a substance called dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is the, the, the most powerful known hallucinogenic drug known to man. My next book will be dealing with the neurological and neurochemical basis of a belief that the pineal gland generates endogenous, that's internally generated dimethyltryptamine. This is why we have these altered states of consciousness. This is why we have near-death experiences, out-of-the-body experiences, and why they are all linked to these particular times of stress. Well, I mean, I I've just finished reading an, uh, yet more of um, Rick Strassman's research. Excellent. Um, you know, out of date now, but some, some of which I hadn't read. And the whole question of, of DMT naturally occurring in all sorts of living creatures and, and plants it's, it's a fascinating subject. And, you know, if you, when you complete your work on it, we must talk about that. Uh, yes, I suppose for the time for the time being, I find myself sort of the, the words time coming up in, in inverted commas all the time. But for the time being, uh, we'll continue to talk about some of the concepts in the labyrinth of time. Yep. Uh, you mentioned uh, in tangentially a few moments ago, Minority Report. And there is, of course, a section in your book where you look at um, the, the nature of time uh, as explored by popular culture. And I suppose one of the examples that people, one well, of the best known examples that most listeners will be familiar with is the movie Groundhog Day. And that links in with another concept that you uh, posit in the book, which is the notion of the eternal return, which is the idea of cyclic time, cyclical lives that we are, and that ties in, it, in itself with the idea of reincarnation. Uh, so perhaps you could say something about that whole area. Yeah, very yeah, absolutely. Uh, in terms of the ideas of cyclical time and Groundhog Day, um, as a, an interesting aside here, um, I am now in direct contact, email contact with, and indeed in Skype contact, or will be in Skype contact with Danny Rubin. And Danny Rubin was the script writer, um, and the guy who wrote and the original idea for Groundhog Day was Danny's. Danny's an academic at Harvard. And Danny is so intrigued by the implications of my work that he's actually given copies of my first book to all his associates, saying that this guy's hypothesis is rather interesting in terms of how I pull together the whole concept of the eternal return or the eternal recurrence 
into modern philosophy and modern ideas. Now, the term of the eternal return, as the ancient Greeks used to call it, anokouklosis, kouklosis, is, is a belief that's been around for, for, for since the ancient Greeks, since the Stoics. And it has been one of these beliefs that has been somewhat hidden from the general population. And I suspect this is because in Western culture, we, and particularly the uh, Judeo-Christian culture, we have this concept of time being linear, as we said earlier on. In other words, you know, Christ was born once, Christ died, uh, Christ will come again to, to, to save us all. So therefore, things can't happen more than once. But there, are, there have been certain schismatic groups, um, such as the Gnostics, who have believed that time is cyclical. And there have been quite a few very intriguing thinkers in the past, people like Peter Ospensky, Nietzsche, um, various other individuals. But on top of that, this eternal return, an eternal return, is a theme in, in, in literature that's fascinating me. Uh, you may recall in the book I cite um, the Finnegan's Wake um, yes. by James Joyce. If you look at Finnegan's Wake, the, the last sentence of the book and the first sentence of the book are the same sentence. They continue on. The book is, in fact, an eternal return. And, of course, even the title, Finnegan's Wake, it's Finn again, Wake. And mm. Finn again, Finn is the character who, at the start of the, the, the novel, it's his funeral. And they're celebrating because he, I, he, he's died. But again, it's Finn again. You know, and and wake and awake. Is and a isn't, isn't Finn French for uh, the end? The end again, yes. And of course, there's a very famous. If you go up to Holyrood House, in the there's the chair of state that Mary Queen of Scots had embroidered, and on this it's got written. And my French is atrocious, so I'll just read it. En mon fin est mon commencement, which means my beginning is my end, and my end is my beginning. So clearly, even historical characters had a preoccupation with this idea of circularity of time. One of your fellow countrymen, um, uh, Flann O'Brien, uh, who was an Ulsterman, um, wrote an amazing story called The Third Policeman. And again, the third, I mean, Flann O'Brien is the most wonderfully humorous writer. He also wrote, his, um, his real name was Brian O'Nolan. And in The Third Policeman, it's completely circular. It's a circularity. And also another one of your countrymen, um, uh, Samuel Beckett. If you read um, the, 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 the subtext of his most famous play, Waiting for Godot, one of the lines said to give birth over a grave. It's again this symbolism. And I believe most esoteric traditions, most hidden traditions, most mystical traditions know that this circularity of time is the way time is, mm -hmm. which means that we will live this life again many, many times. And in fact, if this is the case, and in my first book I cite this and I, I touch upon it in, in the labyrinth, is that this is how we explain deja vu. This is how we explain these kind of sensations we have that we've been to places before. Because this, this is not reincarnation. It is, it is technically reincarnation to, in its technical terms. You know, we are being reincarnated. We're being replaced in our bodies again. But we're not being reincarnated as somebody else. We're being reincarnated as ourselves, living our lives. You know, you as Greg Moffat will be Greg Moffat again and again and again and again. Um, Peter Ospensky wrote an amazing novel based upon this concept called The Strange Life of Ivan Osokin. And in this book, the central character is given the opportunity to relive his teenage years. And the irony is he makes exactly the same mistakes he made the first time round which begs some certain questions as to whether we can escape from our own fate. Now, as to how we might live differently or think about life differently if we embrace some of these concepts, um, who can say? But certainly, if we escape from the idea of the, the linear uh, model of birth, death, uh, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition you described earlier, and that death is something to be feared, we're working towards it. Uh, life is short. Heaven or hell awaits us at the end. Uh, a lot of things would change for our experience and how we lived if, if we could break that paradigm. Well, it's one of the central concepts. People, people have misunderstood for, for, for well over 100 years the implications of um, uh, Frederick Nietzsche's concept of the eternal return. And Nietzsche turns around and says that 
you will live this life again and again and again identically you will never ever change it you can never change it you will just live the same life over and over again and in in his book i think it was uh Eki homo i think where he turns round and he says or also spoke zarathustra it is and he turns round and he says that was the most terrible thing i can imagine to live your life over and over again and then he thinks about it and he says well no it wouldn't be because if you knew that every moment of your life as you live it you were going to live that moment an infinite number of times you would make sure that you enjoyed it and you made the best decisions possible okay which is an interesting idea on this but my take on the eternal return because i am actually a believer in the eternal recurrence and my first book goes into great detail of why i believe this is the case neurologically psychologically uh the physics of it uh the science of it um and why to me it is probably the most logical way of uh, of assuming that we could be immortal creatures without actually transgressing any known scientific concept but the idea that if you live your life again you can change it in other words part of you will remember that you've lived this life before and will warn you and again i use the analogy here of the movie groundhog day In Groundhog Day the character the meteorologist um Phil Connors lives the same Groundhog Day which I think is February the 2nd I think he lives the same day over and over again and when he realizes that he's living the same day over and over again he realizes that he has power over the people around him because everybody else isn't aware of the fact so he can manipulate people he can know by testing them out one day he can then know things about them the next day and surprise them with that knowledge and initially he does all the evil things he does all the negative things he wants to bed the girl he want he wants to make money he wants to do all kinds of nasty things then he goes through a period of depression where he tries to commit suicide and every day he commits suicide and wakes up and sunny is sure is singing i've got you babe on his on his um on his alarm clock and he goes through the next day and he kills himself again he goes through the depression and then he starts to think i can do wonderful things here so he teaches himself foreign languages and he teaches himself how to play the piano and then he realizes he can do good for doing good sake so he makes sure he's underneath the tree so a little boy when he falls he catches him he tries to save an old tramp and suddenly he becomes a much better person by living that day over and over again yeah. and and then he's allowed to move on Now I in my hypothesis which I call cheating the ferryman I suggest this is what actually does happen and this is why uh, Danny is so intrigued by my writing because I suggest we live a groundhog life and in fact the Russian language edition of my first book is called groundhog life and I suggest that by living our lives over and over again part of us remembers the past life it's an entity I call the daemon which I discuss in my second book that being can help us because it carries our memories from all our lives to help us our edelon in other words it's like our guardian angel our guardian spirit this being can help us live a good life and in the end like the buddhists believe we live the perfect life we live sat and we go into samsara you know we we are we live the perfect life and we move on and i find this very very reassuring because it means that all the mistakes i've made in my life i'll get the opportunity to put them right Well, which is wonderful well actually you anticipated my next question perfectly because i was going to tie in the notion of um some sort of universal groundhog day with certain eastern spiritual traditions and the idea of an eternal return a life lived again and again yes but up to a point until we get out of here the idea that there's some purpose behind it and that the eternal return is eternal up to a point Yes, I agree totally with that. It's one of the things I've thought long and hard. What what is happening is there's been a seed change in myself and in terms of my writing. You know, I've recently had my 58th birthday and I'm starting to ponder my own mortality as my 60th birthday approaches. You tend to start to think about these things when you get to my age. And what is happening is my writing is is changing in the sense that I'm becoming more technically teleological in the sense that up until now I've always refused to be drawn on what i think is the ultimate implications of my hypotheses uh and i'm coming to the conclusion now that that there is 
it is developmental and I think that it has a reason and it has an outcome. And I believe what this is, is, is the fact that it is not the eternal return. It is a series of returns. But effectively, we will run out of, of energy or whatever, because we initially I used to believe that you could come back time and time again in the final seconds of your life. But each time you come back, the amount of time that is available to you to fall out of becomes less because you've eaten up a tiny bit of the time. Now, there is a point where time stops. It's called the Planck time, which is, my, is 10 to the minus 43 of a second. So that is uh, 0.43 zeros and then a 1. So that's a very, very small amount of time. But at that point, time stops. There is no more time available. So in which case, there will be a point where you cannot continue coming back. And I believe that's the point where you, you, like Connors does, you move on to the next day. And you move on to whatever your belief system tells you is heaven. Because I argue that we create our own internal universes by modeling the world around us. The brain models the world around us. There is nothing you are receiving through your senses now that is interfacing directly with reality. Your visual system is being created by your brain. Your brain is creating an image in your head that is based upon a very, very small inverted image the size of a postage stamp on the back of your eye that has been converted into electrical impulses in the neurons of your brain. This is how the brain creates the reality we see, and it records it. So your reality is the reality. In fact, I think is this is the implications of the twin slit experiments and the, com the role of the observer in the sense that we are the reality we create. And I believe this is because in a much deeper level of reality, we are all the same being. We are all related. We are all part of the same something. It's very much what the, the American comedian Bill Hicks said, you know, and he said effectively, we are all one, one entity, one intelligence perceiving itself subjectively and individually. So in which case, this is the concept of God, not God in the idea of the Judeo-Christian or the Islamic God, but a God more of the fact that God is within you. God is you. God is part of you. God is something that is the collective consciousness of all intelligent creatures across the universe. And we're all just part of the same thing. And you go back into this, this, this sea of intelligence, this, this sea of light is the term. I'm coming to the conclusion it is. And we just go back into it. And then we, we, we go into whatever we want to go. And I think when people take entheogens, which are, which are um, substances that change our perceptions of reality, such as dimethyltryptamine, this is the world you go into. You go into a trip into inner space, what I call the intramatic experience. So I think this is the future for all of us. I can't prove this yet, but I believe there's, there's strong evidence to assume that this could be the case. Well, this is a... Uh, an area that you get into uh, in the latter part of your book when you're positing a new model of time and what you call uh, uh, rather grandly and why not a grand theory of everything yeah i mean it's um what I, what you, it's really quite strange the whole writing process and the writing process that i've i've followed over the last 10 years or so is that i never intended to write i never expected a book that i'd written to be picked up by a publisher and published I then expected probably 10 people, my friends, to buy it. Here I am sitting down backwards, looking back on that first book now, with 37,000 copies sold worldwide, translated into various foreign languages. Even last week it was translated into Croatian. And I sit back and I never thought I would write more than one book. And all these books seem to be going in a direction. They're now, they're now becoming a theme. And each book... I start a book, for instance, when I started the book on time, it was not intended to come up with any kind of grand conclusion about time. All I wanted to do was to write a book about time. But what I found was that it reflects the material of my previous book, The Outer Body Experience. And it now, both those books have elements in them that will be in my next book, um, the, uh, the Gateway to Infinity. And each one of these things, they link 
and they iterate and they they more information comes in. I put something on Facebook today and I said initially I used to use the analogy of my ideas I came together like a jigsaw puzzle. But the jigsaw puzzle, there are pieces now within the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And I'm coming to the conclusion, instead of a two-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, it's a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. And in fact, I probably think that it's even greater than this, that it's, it's uh, one of these, it's a plant set, it's, it's, it's a hypercube. It's a Penrose hypercube. It has so many different levels to it. And all of them are pointing in one direction, which is this idea about human consciousness and how it relates to reality. And it well, stops me, it amazes me. Well, your general reflection on where your work is going and how everything ties together really reminds us that one of the, the perhaps central uh, idea or way of looking at things that has made our modern uh, materialistic scientific society what it is, you know, the idea that science and spirituality are diametrically opposed that's a relatively new concept in human history and not before time, so to speak, it's, <laughs> it's starting to come apart. Things are starting to overlap and starting to realize that science and spirituality are not separate disciplines and that all is one. And that I mention that because that's when I meditate, that's my mantra, you know, all is one. It's incredibly powerful. It speaks to me as a fundamental truth. And in fact, you refer to, um, you know the section of the, your book that we're talking about um uh, you know all the particles being superimposed at the big bang and that the universe is a sing ultimately a single entity reflects that too it does and the thing is you you look at the quotations and particularly some of the scientists who are particle physicists it's probably not particularly well known but uh erwin schrodinger towards the end of his life wrote some incredibly mystical mystical things. Einstein became very, very mystical and um, spiritual the way he saw things, because I think it is very difficult to not go into particle physics and not be away, amazed at the wonderment. I think it was Sir James Jeans, and it's definitely somebody Jeans, who came up with a wonderful quotation when he turned around and he said, the more I know about physics and the nature of the universe, the more it becomes less of a great machine and more of a great thought. You know, and that's the way, you know, I used to be an extreme materialist. I really did. And very mechanical in my viewpoint. You know, you take something apart and you understand it. You can't do that with the brain. You can't do it with a lot of things. We can't reduce things to the component parts to help us understand things. Because we find this, the deeper we get into subatomic particles, the more particles we find. It's as if it's, it's mirrors within mirrors. So clearly the reality that we believe to be reality is far more wonderful at its fundamental levels than we can ever imagine. But we use the analogy, you know, we, we look at the world through our eyes. We perceive reality through a very, very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, when we believe this is all there is, we, we vibrate at particular levels. We could be, there could be beings that vibrate at completely different levels. And to me, what is most important is we have to get away with this compartmentalization, the Western way of thinking. Things are black or they're white. It's science or it's spirit. When in fact, I'm very much becoming towards the position of non-dualism, that I believe that matter and spirit are the same thing. They are exactly the same thing. It's just that we perceive them as being differently. Different. Yeah. The vibrational universe, I mean, that's something that David Icke is constantly talking about and that actually most of the universe is exists on a vibrational level. And it's only when the vibrations slow down sufficiently that they coalesce into matter, uh, mm -hmm. which and matter, as we understand it, is actually it makes up a very small part of the of the universe. Well, this is one of the thing again that uh, Jeans um, came up. Jeans Jean, made a wonderful statement, which will be in my next book, where he turned around and he said that um, for him, light is bottled matter. No, matter is bottled light, and light is unbottled matter. In other words, the idea that light itself is the base of everything, or it's light at a different vibrationary level. Now, if you look into Buddhism. You look into most of the major religions. You look into the incidents when people have near-death experiences. They go to the light. You look at a lot of the religious doctrines, even the Judeo-Christian doctrines, particularly elements of the Kabbalah or Gnosticism or Islamic Sufism. The central concept of this is the primacy of light. 
and light is the base source. We are all made of light because, of course, if you think about it, a photon, which is the particle, a particle of light. But when people use the term particle, they assume it's like an atom or, or an electron uh, or a photon. But it's not because if we think about it, a photon always, always travels at the speed of light. It can't go any slower than the speed of light. So when you when you turn on your torch, the photons are already at the speed of light. They don't accelerate to the speed of light. They're already at the speed of light. Photons themselves at the speed of light. We know quite a few things. We know there is no time. So from the viewpoint of a photon, there is no time. It is, lives in a timeless state. Therefore, for a photon, from the first moment of the Big Bang, the photons coming out from the first moment of the Big Bang to the Big Crunch, as far as they're concerned, it's all a permanent now. Now, on top of that, photons do not have physical presence in space. They have zero mass. So suddenly we have these things that don't, don't exist in physical space, are timeless, and yet it's the things that I'm seeing the screen as I'm talking to you now. That's mind blowing. And I defy any scientist or any materials reductionist to, 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 to say other than that, that it is completely fantastic. And if you can't see the wonder and the amazement of that, you know, I don't need to be into to new age stuff. I don't need to. Science itself is enough gives me enough buzz and wonderment that I could ever need. And it tells me that an awful lot of the stuff that new age people talk about is there. Exactly. It's just a Within question of it's just a question of perspective, isn't it really? It is. You know, and perspective itself, you know, even even the words we use, it's a question of perspective. What is perspective? It's the way in which light waves diffract and hit the eye. You know, everything is light. Um, and I believe that mankind is now coming to the point that these things, the man in the street has to be made aware of these things. He's been too long denied the basic facts of things like the Schrodinger's cat experiments and the various other wonderful things that are actually happening in science. There's a guy called Anton Zeilinger at the University of Vienna. He's been bouncing entangled particles. You know, the thing I was telling you about earlier when you entangle two particles. He's been bouncing them off satellites and getting amazing results. We have a new form of energy that they're sure is there called zero point energy. This this is energy that's in the vacuum of space. This is energy that exists at, at, at absolute zero where no energy should exist. Empty space is not empty. There is no such thing as a vacuum. It's a plenum. It's full of energy. And this energy is light energy. And this, I think, is the secret. These are where the alternate universes are. This is where the alternate dimensions of space and time are. They're there. They're right. They're in our fingertips. Well, they're in a teardrop. You, you mentioned the zero point field, which uh, some people may or may not be familiar with. But um, this touches upon one of my pet subjects, which is the, the you know, energy and uh, specifically in our day to day experience, how we how we power things, you know, how we get light and heat and how we make the world go round in that respect. And the current uh, problems we seem to be having on that front that only look like they're going to get worse and the suppression of research into uh, so-called free energy and uh, zero point um, technologies. Um, to me, it seems that I, I don't understand how fundamentally we can have an energy problem or an energy crisis when the whole universe is energy. You mm -hmm. are energy. I am energy. Now, of course, it may not be that easy to translate that into some mechanical effect we'd like to achieve. But the bottom line is that there's nothing but energy all around us. Well, of course, that, you know, when, when people talk about nuclear weapons and atomic bombs, of course, where do people think the energy, for the destructive energy of uh, a nuclear device comes from? And it comes from releasing the energy within a tiny bit of matter. It's literally by vaporizing and releasing the energy in a tiny bit of matter that we can cause a nuclear explosion. This is the power of the energy that we have. It's a question of how to get it out in a safe way. It's like this business of cold fusion and the idea that, you know, at, um, at the point of um, zero, uh, at absolute zero, uh, matter itself starts to act very strangely. Um, there are liquids, there are super liquids that flow upwards. 
there are the, the energy that is coming up from the zero point field was discovered in 1947 or the elements of it um, by a guy called Casimir. And again, all I'd suggest is anybody out there, just look up the Casimir effect. You know, again, you know, this, this is this is hard science. He, he was a researcher at the Phillips Res at Eindhoven, the Phillips Research Facility in the Netherlands. They've known about this. Indeed, there is a company in Boulder, Colorado, that has recently got an American license to start researching and finding ways to get zero point energy out from the zero point field. But what is more intriguing is that if you read the work of Irvin Laszlo, uh, who wrote, who ironically enough, and honored me by he's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize twice, and he nominated, he wrote the foreword to my, my book on the out of the body experience. And Irvin Laszlo has written a book called Science in the Akashic, the Akashic Field. And in this book, he cites examples of, of exactly how this zero point field is in fact the old Ved um, concept of the Akasha in the Vedas, in the, 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 the ancient Indian philosophies. This is a place where all the records of everything that ever can happen and ever will happen are contained. This is, this is the database that the universe runs upon. This is the CD-ROM that, that runs the game that we're all existing within. And again, if anybody's interested in the science of this, I suggest they check out the writings of a guy called Tom Campbell, who's written a trilogy of books called My Big Toe. Tom, again, is a physicist, and Tom writes and does the science of how this model can occur. And indeed, there are many, many scientists these days, um, one or two of them are really focusing in on this idea and the evidence that we are existing within a computer program. And this is a computer program that we're existing within. And indeed, some of them have, have said that the evidence is almost overpowering that this is the case. So in which case, you know, we have some interesting areas that science is going to be taking us in the 21st century, but only as long as the shackles are released and people and, and scientists break out of this materialist reductionist idea. It explains the physics of the world we exist in now, the world of large ob well, objects of our size. But it falls down cosmologically and it falls down within the world of particle physics. We need to break out of this. The people, I mean, I'm a great admirer of people like Richard Dawkins, but Richard is missing the point. Yes. Richard, Richard cannot explain thought. Yeah, David Chalmers, who's an astrophilosopher, has come up with this concept. Sorry, go on. Sorry, it, I was just simply going to say that as far as Dawkins is concerned, uh, we must be careful uh, in our if we choose to oppose religion, uh, not to become religious in our opposition. Exactly. You know, that's the whole thing that what is happening now is that material reductionism has become scientism. It has become a faith. And to actually say anything against the faith is dangerous. You, most scientists have tenure. They can't be going out and doing things that they would like to do because they're not allowed to. And I speak to a lot of scientists and quantum physicists and neurologists, and they basically agree with a lot of what I'm doing, but they can't come out and say so because they have a university tenure that they'll lose. Because the minute they turn around and show any interest, uh, Bruce Rosenberg, the guy that wrote this book um, on consciousness, in the beginning of his book, he describes how he had so much trouble. This is, a, this is the professor of physics at UCLA. They tried to, to sack him because he'd written this book. This is the level of the inquisition that is now taking place within science. And it's, it's ridiculous. It's holding us back. And this is the point I was making when I, I was flying there from Richard Dawkins to the, the, the ideas of scientists now that are, that are opening up their ideas. Because as soon as they retire, they're allowed to think about these things in a positive way. But what we can't do is go so far and to be so open minded that our brains fall out. And I think that's the problem. I feel that there is a, a spectrum of beliefs within the, the kind of the alternate science movement. And there are people that go to so much extremes that they're the people that are attacked by the, the, the skeptics. The skeptics love them. In fact, I was invited to give a talk to the Liverpool University Skeptics Society to 18 months ago. They clearly were expecting me to be, me to be some new age woo-woo. And they were obviously really looking forward to getting an Anthony Peak and tearing him apart. Somebody started checking up on my writing and my, my, my stuff on the web. They pulled out. They wouldn't give me the opportunity to talk to them. 
And they wouldn't do that because they were scared. They knew that they couldn't make me look stupid. In New York, three years ago, I did a, a lecture in front of 350 people in, in Manhattan. And in the audience was, a, was a, a professor of physics, I guess, at one of the local universities. And he stood up and he tried to, he tried to really put me on the spot in front of this huge audience, and he turned around and he said, I don't believe a word you're saying, nor do I believe you really understand the science you're talking about. Will you now, off the top of your head, without reference, explain to me Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? So I did. And he sat down, and then he walked out. That's the level of opposition you get. But they won't stand there and then discuss it with you, because I said, I, can I talk, discuss this with you afterwards? Never saw him again. Well, I've never met <clears throat> oddly enough, a scientist, or certainly of my generation, that didn't like Star Wars. And I quite often wheel that out as an example. I say, look at the Jedi. Is there a more perfect example of science and spirituality coming together? This yeah. is, it's, we probably live in something like a Jedi universe, you yeah. know, and uh, just be all that we can't perceive uh, with our five senses, uh, you know, that's not to say that it isn't there. Well, we this... This is the whole point, isn't it? I keep using this example of empirical science. Empirical comes from the Greek word from experience. Now, we all, every, every single grounded scientist is taking information from his machinery, which is being processed by his brain to be presented to his consciousness. There's a process going on there. People like Daniel C. Dennett, um, who are what's called eliminative materialists. Eliminative materialists don't even believe that we're conscious. We fool ourselves into this. Now, this is Skinnerism gone mad. This is the idea that we don't even have an inner life. I'm fooling myself into thinking I'm a conscious being, that I have memories and anticipations. Who on earth Daniel Dennett thinks wrote his book, Consciousness Explained? I have absolutely no idea, because he clearly didn't, because he's not there to write it. Now, there is an Australian philosopher by the name of David Chalmers, and Chalmers has come up with a concept he calls the hard problem. And the hard problem is, how does inanimate matter, which effectively my brain is, becomes organic matter, but it's still inanimate, can create the concept of Anthony Peake, or in your, your brain, the, the concept of Greg Moffat, your hopes, your fears, your anticipations. Yes, well, this is the idea. They can't explain qualia. They can't explain how that's read. Uh, well, yeah, quite. And this is the idea that Newtonian science can explain everything until it can't. Yes. And if it can't explain anything, it's ignored. The, the old diktat of the, the modern science is that everything that exists can be measured. If it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. Nobody's and, ever measured a thought. Well, quite. And, and this uh, dissonance between... Uh, modern materialistic reductionist science wanting to have fixed answers and have them now, thank you very much, and an actual ever-expanding hyper-reality of, of possibilities and unknowables is kind of summed up, really. It's where you end up in your new book, The Labyrinth of Time, by basically admitting at the end that you have generated more questions than answers about the nature of time. And the question almost at the end of the book isn't so much what is time, but what is? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's so true, isn't it? The one thing I found, Socrates made the very, very famous quotation that he said, the more I know, the less I know. And that's what I found with myself. I find that the more I learn about nature of reality and everything else, the older I get, I'm just gobsmacked at the lack of knowledge I have. I, I'm not even at first base of understanding a lot of these things. But I'm hoping that people who read my books will go off and they'll take their own little bit and go away and research and look into it. I genuinely don't believe that a lot of my ideas, they may, they may get into the general consensus. They may break out into the, 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 um, what Gladwell calls the, 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 the tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell, the idea that there is a point when certain ideas will take off. And we are long, myself and my associates have long hoped that tree cheating the ferryman, the bony and IMAX, all the other terminologies that we're using in my, my in the philosophy that we're putting forward at the moment will break out there at some stage. It will probably be after I'm long gone. But these ideas have to be carried forward. 
I'm not a messenger, I'm not a guru, I'm nothing. I'm just an ordinary guy that had a few ideas. Um, but the ideas resonate, and they resonate because I'm coming from the position of an enthusiastic layman. And I ask naive questions because I'm a layman and because I'm outside of tenure and I'm outside of everything else. I don't have to restrict where I go with my ideas. That doesn't invalidate my ideas, nor does it invalidate my position. All it means is I'm freer than a lot of people out there and able to do it. Well, whatever happens after you're gone, you'll be back. Hey, absolutely. Well, oh, brilliant, Greg. I wish I thought of that one. <laughs> well, Superb. as we begin to wrap it up for today, I mean, I have to say it's been absolutely fascinating and equally as fascinating as reading The Labyrinth of Time was. And uh, as we do wrap it up, is, if there's anything else that you'd like to touch upon um, or simply to point people to uh, who may be interested in your work where they can find out more. Yeah, please, because one of the things that we're doing at the moment is this has become a movement of, of like-minded individuals from across the world. Involved in this now, I have quantum physicists, I have neurologists, I have brain surgeons, I have psychologists, psychiatrists, you name it. We focus together. There are, there are various places you can find me and interface with me. And believe me, I respond. I respond to emails. I chat with people on Facebook and everywhere else. So don't feel I can't be approached, okay? Um, I also do lots of lectures. For instance, this summer uh, and bank holiday weekend at the end of May, I'm in London doing a major talk at the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival in Earl's Court. Um, and also, if you look on my website, you'll find details of the other events I'm doing. But my website is anthonypeak.com. That's Anthony with an H and P-E-A-K-E dot -E com. Also, you'll find on there a, a list of the events I'm doing. And I also have an extremely active forum that used to be the Anthony Peak Forum, but I've moved that away from it now because I want it to belong to its members. And you'll find it if you work up cheatingtheferryman.com, cheatingtheferryman.com. And if you look up there, you'll find a forum. Please join that forum. We have over a thousand people involved in that, and we have some great minds, lots of professional writers, researchers, um, you know, we've got even, for instance, we've got Gary Lackman, who used to be the lead guitarist of Blondie on there, who's now a writer. He used to be Gary Valentine. Mm. Uh, we've got, uh, this weekend, I'll be interviewing Dr. Andreas Mavromatis, who's on there, who's the world's leading expert in hypnagogia, which is that kind of liminal state between sleeping and awake. Also, I'm on Facebook, so just let me look at Anthony Peak. You'll find me straight away and join me there. Also on Facebook, we have another readers group called the It Lad Walker Group. It Lad is I-T-L-A-D. It's just the initials of my first book, Is the Life After Death. Join us on there. That's a much more immediate debate. And there's been lots of discussions on there, even this morning. So there's lots of stuff on there. And what I'd like to do is just thank Greg for being the first person to interview me on the new book. This is the first ever interview I've done on this book. And I will be making sure that everybody is aware of this interview, both on Facebook and in other places as well, to so just check it out. Because, Greg, you've done a great interview there, and it's wonderful to, to talk to somebody that has done the research and actually read the book and has been able to, 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 to make comments on it as well. So thank you very much for that. It's much appreciated. Oh, not at all. It's been, it's been absolutely wonderful talking with you uh, today. And once again, Anthony Peak, thank you very much for joining us today on LegalizeFreedom.com. Thanks, Greg. Well, that's it for another time. And uh, as Anthony mentioned, his main website uh, is anthonypeak.com. And there you can find out all about his work and also find links to uh, other relevant online resources. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, I'm Greg Moffat, and you've been listening to legalizefreedom.com. <laughs>